Well, you know, the Bible is full of scary families. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, and we were trying to think of a family in the Scripture that really wasn't a scary family. And I, and I mentioned, well, what about Mary and Joseph? You know, that's the family in which Jesus was born. You know, that's got to be a normal, healthy, loving family. And, and my friend looked at me and he said, yeah. You know, you know he threatened to, to take, her and take her to the other city and, and leave her there, you know, in the very beginning. And, and I'm starting to think, oh, yeah, I forgot about that part of the story, you know, that uh, it was a scary, some scary situations in that family, too, that long donkey ride from Nazareth to Bethlehem. You know, I don't know of a family in the Scripture that didn't have some scary moments. And, you know, I don't know of a family today that doesn't have some scary moments. That's why families need faith. That's why we need to respond in faith, not fear, as we talked about in this last session. In this next session, I want to talk about uh, something a little differently. I'd like to talk more about parenting. And the title of my message is, When the Patients Take Over the Asylum... That can happen sometimes, and when it does, of course, it produces a scary family. You know, there are a lot of things that produce a fright within family life. People tend to lose their inhibitions around family. They assume liberties around family members that they never try elsewhere. Family members are prone to take one another for granted. All kinds of weird stuff can happen in a family. And, of course, that's why family life can get very, very scary. As we did in the first session, in each of the sessions, I want to start by showing a few photos of some spooky families. And I need to do this because I'm sure that most of you have no idea what a scary family really is. I mean, you live in such healthy, normal, loving families that when I say scary family, this is like so foreign to you, you, you just have no idea. So I have to do this. I have to show you a few s snapshots to kind of get you in the mood. So, uh, we got a few more. Here's uh, some kids with Santa Claus. <laughs> and uh, you notice Santa Claus there. He's got a shiner. How often do you see Santa with a shiner? He's been cold cocked. And when I looked at that picture, you know, the thought went through my mind, maybe the kids did it. And that's really scary. Well, here's a nice family portrait right here. The girls are in dresses and the boy is sporting a tie, and dad has his best Bermuda shorts on. I have no idea what that's about. That's kind of scary, but, but what's up with Junior here? I mean, while everyone is saying, cheese, he's choking mom. I mean, that's, uh, that's got to be a scary situation. Speaking of mom, you really got to feel sorry for this mom. You know, for the professional portrait, you want everybody to look nice, and I'm sure her son wearing black lipstick is not exactly what she had in mind. This goth kid here is, is, is really a bit scary, I, I would think. And then finally, another portrait. I mean, what are these parents thinking? I mean, why dress your seven kids up in prison garb? I mean, what kind of aspirations do you have for your kids to dress them up like this? Our family, the chain gang? I mean, this is really scary. Which leads us to this next episode, when the patients take over the asylum. You know, when there's a leadership vacuum in a family, the members of that family go nuts. There's no guidance. People act selfishly. They harm rather than help each other. I want to start this session by reading the last verse of the book of Judges, Judges chapter 21, verse 25. It speaks of Israel at a time of great peril, but it also describes the lack of leadership in families today. Judges chapter 21, verse 25 tells us, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You see, here was the cultural climate that led to Israel's cry for a monarchy. There was no consensus on right and wrong. There was no moral imperative that made sense out of life. Everyone did as they pleased. Self-gratification ruled the day. And Israel was desperate for leadership, for spiritual leadership. 
And when our homes lack leadership, when our homes lack moral authority, it too is Katie bar the door, families get scary, anything goes. Maybe you've seen the AMC show, The Walking Dead. Have you seen this show, this television show? Some of you have. It's about a post-apocalyptic world where social structures have crumbled, anarchy rules the streets. The world is overrun with zombies, former humans who've been traumatized in some way. In the show, they're called walkers, and they're walking, they're the walking wounded, and they're roaming around, they're preying on anything alive. The few surviving humans are in fear of the shuffling zombie hordes who are out to get them. This is what the show's about. Now, I'm not sure the intention, it was the intention of the show's writers, but it seems to me that The Walking Dead is a cultural metaphor of what's going on in today's world and the horror that exists today. For we, too, live in a time when the foundations of truth and morality have been torn down. Spiritually speaking, anarchy reigns, and it has produced a crippled generation that lacks a conscience that lacks a moral compass. People today are like spiritual zombies. They're roaming around. They're preying on other folks, led around only by their own appetites. And it's a tragedy. And sadly, all of our vain efforts aren't fixing the problem. Have you noticed this? Condom distribution and clean needles And anti-bullying campaigns aren't teaching morality to our kids. It begins at home. What goes on in the streets is a direct reflection of what's happening in the homes. Recently, the mayor of Philadelphia, a man named Michael Nutter, he went off on a 25-minute rant against his city's parents. And I quote Mayor Nutter, Parents, get your act together right now. Or you're going to find yourself spending quality time with your kids in jail. If you're not providing moral instruction to your children, you're just a human ATM. Amen. That little guy got it. It's dads and moms that teach, that need to teach their kids truth and morality today. Or else the kids will grow up confused and undisciplined and self-absorbed. Oh, for a society of thinking, loving, principled folks, not selfish walkers on the prowl for more to consume. At the turn of this past century, the 20th century, Thomas Keeler, he wrote this, I care little for the government that presides at Washington in comparison with the government that rules millions of American homes. The home rules the nation, and it's true. The home does rule the nation. But when there's no one holding the reins, when dad vacates his role and responsibility, or when mom gets distracted by other concerns, kids are left to grow up on their own. And that's when families get scary. And we just read of the terrible conditions that existed in Israel in the days of the judges. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Well, there was a prominent man who lived at the time whose name was Eli. Eli, he lived in the hills of Shiloh. He lived at the tabernacle. And as the Hebrew high priest, he offered up prayers and praise and sacrifices to God. He even entered the Holy of Holies to intercede for the people. Eli was the spiritual leader of the nation Israel. But for some reason, Eli failed to lead his own family. You wonder, how can this be? He's the big man at the tabernacle, but he's a big flop at home. In some ways, Eli's influence touched an entire nation, but somehow it missed his own boys. Was he too busy with church work to tend to his own sons? Whatever it was that tripped up Eli, we're not sure, but his sons made a mockery of the things of God. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22, we're told, Now Eli was very old, and he heard everything his sons did to all Israel. 
and how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now, this was a sizzling sex scandal. Imagine the headlines in the Jerusalem Post. Eli's sons, priests no less, were guilty of brazen rebellion and immorality. They were hosting orgies on the steps of God's house. This news rocked the priesthood. It heaped shame on the nation, and it cast a cloud over Eli's ministry. You know, when Eli first received news of his son's immorality, he reprimanded them. But it was little more than a slap on the wrist. It wasn't the action that God required. When God pronounces judgment on the house of Eli, he speaks sternly. He says this, I have told Eli that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile, and he did not restrain them. Now notice Eli's sin. He failed to restrain his sons. And as a result, our Father God held this father at least partly responsible for the sins of his children. Notice the job of every father, every father in this room, in this town, in this country, in this world, the role of every father first and foremost is to restrain his children. A dad's duty is to curb their rebellion and tame their temper and diffuse their defiance. Yes, every father needs to nurture his kids. Dad, you need to be a loving guy. You need to show compassion and kindness toward your children. Be loving by all means. But a dad's primary obligation is to keep his kids in check. You see, a dad is the captain of the ship. And it's his main responsibility to put down mutinies when they occur. God puts a dad in charge of the training and leadership of his kids. Hebrews 12 reminds us that a father who truly loves his son will discipline him. The dad who never restrains his kids, who always gives in to what they want, despite what he says, really doesn't love his kids, not according to God's word. One night, I had retired to the living room early. I was looking forward to a night of Monday night football. I'd already put my kids down to bed. My three-year-old had gone down squirming, though. I knew it. I knew he wasn't really ready to head to bed, but the kid needed to learn some discipline, and Dad had some football to watch. And I'd just gotten comfortable in the lazy boy when all of a sudden, my three-year-old son, he comes trotting through the living room wanting to see his mom. I said, son, what in the world are you doing up out of bed after I've put you to bed? And I'll never forget that little guy's response. He looked at me with the most defiant look on his face, and he said, Dad, mind your own business. <laughs> oh, my. Well, I proceeded to show that little guy exactly what my business was. <laughs> I spanked his little rump and put him down for the final time. I'm just saying a dad's business, his God-ordained business is to restrain and discipline his kids. And at three years old, I hate to tell you, but it's just beginning. Don't ever forget, God brought judgment on the house of Eli because he failed to restrain his sons. But honestly, that doesn't really satisfy my curiosity. For why did Eli, of all people, drop the ball? He was a priest. I mean, he lived his life for God. What caused him to fail his own family? How did a priestly family end up a scary family? Well, I want to spend the rest of my time in this session painting three more pictures that I help, hope explain why a dad, or a parent for that matter, vacates the leadership in the home. And when they do, the zombies or the walkers or the kiddos or the relatives or whatever you want to call them, they end up taking over. The patients end up running the asylum. You know, the first portrait I want to present to you this morning is King David. And I'm actually reluctant to cast David in any kind of negative light, for there is so much commendable about this man. I mean, 
David was the man after God's own heart. You remember David was a warrior. He feared only God. He fought God's battles. He was the one who took on the Philistine champion and conquered Goliath. Under David's reign, the 12 tribes, they were consolidated. The nation Israel expanded its borders. Good, thing, good things happened for the most part under David's leadership. And David was also a worshiper. He knew God's heart like few others. He wrote nearly half the Psalms, the Hebrew hymnal. History knows David as a dude, but at home, David was a dud. It's so sad. Like Eli, here's a man who inspired a nation but failed his own family. The David who ran to confront Goliath stood by while his own house veered off the rails. As a dad, here was David's problem. In a nutshell, he was paralyzed by guilt. You recall the fateful night. It was springtime when normally kings are off to battle. But David stayed home. He, he wanted to just take it easy, enjoy a little R&R. &R. In my word, if anybody deserved a vacation, it was David. But idleness, you see, is the devil's workshop. And that night after dinner, as he strolled along the balcony, as he surveyed the city, the city that he had built, he caught a glimpse in the moonlight of a naked woman. Her shadowy silhouette haunted him. He had to meet this woman. He had to admire her beauty up close. His rendezvous with Bathsheba obviously led to adultery, an illegitimate pregnancy and lies and the murder of her husband, an ugly cover-up that went on for over a year. It was awful. And all the guilt, it devastated David. In fact, he writes of his experience later in one of his psalms, Psalm 32. He says, when I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality turned to the drought of summer. I mean, on the surface, he was going about his royal duties, you know, pretending to be king. But all the time, his guilt was eating him up on the inside. He knew what he had done. When you track David's life, you can make a case that he never really recovered from his own personal failure. 2 Samuel 11 and 12 recount David's adultery and how God brought it to the light of day in a very public way. When the baby died shortly after his birth, David rightly took it as God's judgment. The blood of his own son was now in his hands, and it caused the king great grief. Though King David rose up and he went back to work, it seems he never overcame the shame of his sin. Guilt paralyzed his parenting. You see, David never regained the high ground in his own family. He forever felt unworthy. He forfeited his authority as a result, and he never found a way to rise up and get it back. It's no accident that the very next chapter, 2 Samuel 13, we see David's family unraveling. Right after his sin, we see his family unraveling. The king has a son named Amnon who falls in love with his half-sister Tamar. This Amnon is a weasel. He is everything that David is not. He's a snake in the grass. He feigns a sickness and he lures Tamar into his bedroom. The spoiled brat, he professes his love to the princess, but when she refuses his advances, he rapes Tamar. And in 2 Samuel 13, verses 14 and 15, the whole event gets recounted. We're told, being stronger than she, he forced her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, Arise, be gone. I told you he was a weasel. What an awful person. Amnon uses her up, and then he spits her out. And here is the blight on David's record. He did nothing. This catastrophe, this crisis, this moral crisis occurs in his own family, and he does nothing as a result. The scripture says, when King David heard all these things, he was very angry. Oh, he got angry, but he did nothing. The king of Israel, 
More importantly, the head of his own household refused to step in and step up and address the injustice. He refused to discipline his own family. 2 Samuel 13, verse 23 tells us, And it came to pass after two full years. Two years, mind you. Two full years, David overlooked his son's sin. He ignored the brutality under his own roof and its impact on Tamar. She had been violated. Did her dad even care? Well, her brother Absalom, he cared. He lured Amnon into his kitchen where the rapist was stabbed to death. And rather than get mad at himself for creating this scenario, forcing the elder brother to take matters into his own hands, David took out his anger on Absalom. It caused a breach in David's own family that never healed. In fact, David's conflict with Absalom later results. It erupts into a full-scale rebellion. Absalom and his friends, they launch a coup d'etat to drive David off the throne. In the end, David's son Absalom dies, and though David's rule is restored, his heart is broken forever. It's a terrible story. But here's what I believe. I believe that guilt is a terrible obstacle for a parent to overcome. You see, a parent with a checkered past has a hard time coming down on his kids when they make the same mistakes. Parents become paralyzed. Promiscuous kids later become permissive parents. Here's what a parent thinks. Well, who am I to steer my kids away from drugs? Man, I used to smoke pot all the time or, or even worse. Parents think, how can I come down on my daughter for dressing a little provocatively when she was born three months before her dad and I got married? Parents think, I can't get too upset over my son's poor grades when I dropped out of school my junior year. This is what parents think, but that's not what they need to think. You know, I disagree. Who are you? I'll tell you who you are, parents. You're your kid's parent. That's who you are. You're the parent. It's time you stopped sulking and stood up in the grace of God and started acting like a parent. You see, just because you were a rebellious kid doesn't mean you have to be a reluctant parent. I've always told my kids that if they don't turn out better than me, I'll be severely disappointed. I mean, don't, don't try to be like your dad. Don't shoot so low. You need to be better than your dad was. And that's not a cop-out on my part. I have been actively involved in the life of my kids. I want them to stand on my shoulders and reach things greater than I was able to reach. I've tried to help my kids avoid the mistakes that I've made. I mean it. I want the best for my kids. My problems growing up have been a motivation in my parenting, not a paralysis. I want my pain to be my kids' gain. Sadly, some of us misunderstand God's forgiveness. You know, we, we, feel, we see ourselves as kind of the disobedient dog that jumped its leash and failed to obey its master, and so we got spanked, and we got brought back in line, and now we're wagging our little tail, chewing on the biscuit, minding our manners again. That's kind of how we view our relationship with God. But understand, God has so much more for you than that. that that's not forgiveness. That's just behavior modification. That's all that is. God's forgiveness deep cleans, man. It changes you from the inside out. It changes who we are in the deepest parts. God cleans up my mind and restores to me my conscience and clothes me in a new identity, a godly identity. I possess a brand new start, and I get a brand new heart when I give my life to Jesus. Big things happen in my life. And that means that I can now parent my kids guilt-free. I don't have to be paralyzed or crippled by my past sins and mistakes. Hey, Jesus retakes the high ground, and he gives it to those who trust in him. Certainly, I'm going to raise my kids with an appreciation and understanding of the grace I've been shown. But the Bible calls me the righteousness of Christ. And if I believe in the power of God to change lives, then I believe His power is sufficient to keep and enable my kids. 
Here's the miracle of the gospel. People who were slaves to sin have become ambassadors for Christ. And the first place we're supposed to live that out is in our own families. Never let your past paralyze your present. Jesus has taken the high ground for you and me. He gives it to us. Now we need to stand on it and parent our kids. But there's another story I need to tell. Genesis 34 exposes another scary family, the family of Jacob. Imagine 12 brothers and one sister. Imagine that. I recall when my son Mac was born, my daughter Natalie, she cried profusely. She thought she wanted a sister. And we went down to the sonogram, the, the doctor's office, and they did the sonogram on Kathy. And I remember little Natalie, she's standing there, and, and the nurse looked at us and smiled, and she said, it's a boy. And Natalie just busted out in tears. I wanted a little sister. And, and I remember assuring her, I said, honey, please, you don't realize if you have another little girl, then you won't be daddy's only princess. You'll have to share his special affections. Favored child status will no longer be yours. <laughs> and after thinking it through for a few seconds, she dried her tears, and I've never heard about it again. <laughs> but this was the case with Dinah. I mean, she was the twinkle in her daddy's eye, man. Twelve bad brothers had her back. And wow, were they mad when they heard about that guy from Shechem who had done the dirty with their beloved sister. You see, one day, Donna had gone out to hang out with the teenage girls at the local mall. And where there are teenage girls, you usually find some teenage boys. A Gentile neighbor saw Dinah and lusted after her. He and Dinah wind up in the back seat of his camel where he steals <laughs> the purity from Jacob's daughter. This boy's name was Shechem. And this Shechem, he rushes home to his daddy and he asks to arrange a marriage. Daddy, I won't find a finer gal than Dinah. He was a little southern. Apparently, Shechem never spoke to Jacob. The brothers intervened. And they could care less about the nuptials. They had one thing on their mind, and that was revenge. But they play it coy. The boys tell Shechem what he wants to hear. Oh, yeah, yeah, why don't we just all remarry? The one problem, though, is that Shechem, you and your, your brothers and all, you aren't circumcised. And so they propose for Shechem to have all of his men circumcised. And then, of course, the weddings will all begin. And Shechem's crew buys it. They believe. They, they agree. Now, I hate to torment the males here this morning. But men, try to imagine for a moment you, a grown man, undergoing the unanesthetized surgical procedure of circumcision. Try to imagine you undergoing this procedure with no anesthesia on your privy member. Just the thought of that is more than a man can bear. This is horrible. As a matter of fact, I have a friend of mine who actually went through this as an adult. He endured this. And, and I was tempted to put him on the video, kind of put him in the shadows. He'd have to be in the shadows. <laughs> and put him on the video and interview him because he told me the story of what he went through to be circumcised at 35 years old. And it was not pleasant, man. It was really, really awful. Uh, I, I, I didn't do that because I wanted to spare you and me, again, the brutal ordeal. But just know, these men were incapacitated after being circumcised as grown men. And that is exactly what Jacob's boys wanted. No one is going to get away with disrespecting our sister. And so on the third day, post-op, they swoop in with drawn swords and they slaughter Shechem and his buddies. It was brutal, man. They were defenseless. It was bloodthirsty. It was wrong. There had to be a better, less violent way to solve the problem 
But evidently, there wasn't a dad around to help the boys think through a more godly reaction. Again, a leadership vacuum created a scary family. It amazes me, too, the first words out of Jacob's mouth when he hears about the bloodlust of his own sons. You won't believe this. I mean, the blood is still dripping from their swords. Genesis 34, verse 30. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites, and since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. Notice, here is the man's first thought. What will the neighbors say? Can you believe it? Not what have you done? Not could you have done something differently? Not don't you know God will judge your actions? None of those things. All Jacob cares about are other people's opinions and his status in the community and what is going to happen to me now that you've done this. More specifically, all he is concerned about is keeping the peace instead of doing what was right. Hey, at least his sons, though horribly misled, at least his sons sought to correct an injustice. All dad wanted was to avoid making waves. Now, here is another reason that parents, particularly dads, back away from leadership in their families. It's because keeping the peace is seen as more important than pursuing what's right. It's peace at any price, even peace over principle. Whatever you do, don't rock the boat. When that's the mentality in your family, it creates for a scary family. This is why a husband cowers to a strong-willed wife. Oh, he laughs it off. He sloughs it off. Well, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. But you know, sometimes mama isn't happy because there's not a man in her life who loves her enough to help her check her emotions and make wise decisions. Few wives like it when their husband disagrees with them, but they need his godly wisdom. A husband isn't loving his wife when he always caves in to unreasonable or emotional demands just to avoid a conflict, just to keep the peace. This is also true of a wife who puts up with an abusive husband. Well, he pays the bills. He puts food on the table. In return, everybody tiptoes around him on pins and needles just to keep him from going ballistic. This makes for unhealthy family dynamics. It creates a scary family. Hey, peace at any price is not a virtue. Just because a man pays the rent and fixes a few leaky faucets doesn't give him the right to run roughshod over the family's feelings and act like a jerk. It's not love that puts up with an abusive spouse. You see, when Jacob gives the brothers his don't make waves rationale, his boys fire back at him in verse 31. But they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? I mean, somebody needs to be held accountable here, whether the neighbors agree or not. What about righteousness? You see, at times the boat needs to be rocked. Real love calls people to task. Jesus, remember, brings grace and truth, whereas peace over principle just creates a scary family. Here's a third and final portrait of a man who failed to lead his family and let the patients take over the asylum. 2 Kings 21 verse 25 tells us, There was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do wickedness in the sight of the Lord, because Jezebel, his wife, stirred him up. Ahab was a man who did evil because he let his wife stir him up. I don't know what all that means, but I can imagine. He followed her lead rather than vice versa. Rather than set a godly pace in his family, he just let his wife lead, even though she would lead him off to hell. Let me say this gently. 
Ahab was a spineless wimp. Ahab was a coward, and his cowardness only emboldened a dangerous woman. King Ahab, he married a Phoenician princess by the name of Jezebel. And you know, that name alone has become infamous. Jezebel. Doesn't it just sound evil? I mean, nobody today names their daughter Jezebel. Hey, cute little Jezebel, come here, honey. That just doesn't work. The word Jezebel, it just reeks of evil. I mean, when the missus is named Jezebel, you know it's a scary family. This woman single-handedly plunged Israel into the dark abyss of, of idolatry. She imported the Phoenician idol Baal and his 850 priests to propagate his blasphemy. Scripture says that Jezebel fed these ambassadors of idolatry with food from the king's own table. Imagine how God felt about that. The state of Israel was subsidizing idolatry, and the king just rolled over and let it happen. Ahab was king of Israel and king over his own castle, but he did nothing to stand up to Jezebel and her evil. He did nothing to stand up to his wife. He vacated leadership because of his cowardice. And a truly mad, crazy woman took over the reins of his family and his nation. There's a frightening story that illustrates all this in 2 Kings chapter 21. I think it's 1 Kings chapter 21. Ahab finds a fruitful vineyard. You'd know about that here in Napa. He finds a fr fruitful vineyard near his palace, and he offers to buy it from its owner. But Nab Naboth, the owner of the vineyard, he refuses to sell. The king comes home, and he lies on his bed, and he pouts like a baby, and he cries his eyeballs out. And Jezebel sees this, and it turns her stomach. Her husband's weakness only emboldens her own sinfulness. She concocts a scheme to frame Naboth, to accuse him of blasphemy and have him stoned to death. Her plan goes off without a hitch. Before long, she's gifting the property deed to her hubby. And rather than investigate his wife's actions, Ahab plays dumb. He takes the vineyard. Why make waves? Why confront a Jezebel? But he should have. For Ahab's complacency provoked God's wrath. God didn't ignore the evil that had been done. In fact, the prophet Elijah, he calls out Ahab. He tells the king that where the dogs licked up Naboth's blood, they are going to feast on his blood. God plans to cut off the house of Ahab and turn Queen Jezebel into puppy chow. Now, how's that for a scary end to a scary family? But this is what happens in a family when leadership is vacated through cowardice. Bloodshed results. Maybe not literally, but I promise you spiritual violence occurs. You see, husbands and wives don't just part ways. They don't just agree to disagree. In a power struggle, people get hurt. They always do. In a power struggle, families end up torn apart. Kids end up stop speaking to their parents. Parents can't stand their kids. It gets ugly. It gets violent in a power struggle. Families become scary families when fathers and mothers succumb to their fears and fail to restrain their kids. Understand, your children are little Jezebels. Did you know that? <laughs> they are. They're little Phoenicians. And just because you bring them to your home from the hospital doesn't mean they're going to embrace your values and worship your God. To the contrary, when you bring a baby home from the hospital, like Ahab bringing Jezebel from Phoenicia to Samaria, your kids are idolaters. They worship themselves. That's what sin does. It focuses on I. Here's the Jezebel attitude. Every kid has it. You want a vineyard? Just take it. Take whatever you want. Your child has to be taught to work hard and to respect other people's property. 
and to make some money and earn the right and obey the law and pay for that property when and if it becomes available. You don't just take what you want. It's been said, give a kid everything and he or she won't appreciate anything. This is the Jezebel attitude. And guys and gals, if you're afraid to stand up to your kids to insist on correct belief and right behavior, they will run wild. Your kids will take over the asylum. A parent's weakness doesn't garner a kid's respect. It does just the opposite. It emboldens their evil. Give in once and just see how often that child will try to exploit your soft spot. They'll try to get you to cave in again and again and again. That's like Ahab's approach to Jezebel. Just let her do as she pleases. Ask no questions. Bury your head in the sand. Hey, you take that kind of approach with your children and your family will turn into a real life horror show. This is why every family needs brave leadership. When a wimp is at the helm, Jezebel takes advantage. Don't you dare take the approach Oh, we're not going to try and influence our kids when it comes to spiritual things. We don't want to impose our values and shove anything down their throat. We're just going to let them choose their own beliefs as they grow up, as they get older. Man, you, you take that approach and you are dooming your kids to, to paganism. I hate to tell you, but that's the height of madness. You are playing right into the devil's hands with that attitude. Don't you understand your kid is not a blank slate? They come into this world with a sin nature. They have a propensity towards selfishness and evil from the very beginning. And neither do they live in a neutral environment. Trust me, the world, the flesh, and the devil are working overtime to influence your kids. You might not want to shove anything down their throat, but the devil does. Every day, a tidal wave of temptation targets your kids. There is a bullseye on their back. And if the parents don't try to protect and influence their kids, who in the world will? Certainly one day, our kids will have to choose for themselves. We won't be able to decide for them. But in the meantime, parents need to, the courage and they need the resolve and the determination to steer their kids in the right direction, even when their kids aren't anxious to follow, especially when they're not anxious to follow. I've heard it said, kids will forgive you for your mistakes, but your cowardice will send them elsewhere for strength. Hey, we all gravitate towards strong leadership. Every human being is looking for something to believe in that's worth standing for and fighting for and living for. Actually, there is a new medical disorder that has now been identified. It's become official. It's been labeled WPS. WPS, Wimpy Parent Syndrome. It starts when you let your kid suck on the pacifier too long because you don't want to deal with their crying. It grows when you buy the toy to stop the temper tantrum and when you reward the guilt trip with a nicer car. If you want a child to learn patience and self-control and some delayed gratification, then the parent has to be strong enough to tolerate the kid's unhappiness at times. It takes guts and some nerve and some gritty faith and an unswerving devotion to what's wise and right to be a good parent. Your daughter is not going to like it when you send her back to the store with her new swimsuit because it's too skimpy. She's not going to like that. Your son is not going to nominate you dead of the year when you take away his car keys after he gets a speeding ticket. Parents need to remember we're not running for re-election. Your kids have plenty of friends who will tell them what they want to hear, but you're their parent, remember? Remember that? Look down at that parent badge on your chest. You're the parent. And your job is to tell your kids what they need to hear. 
You see, one thing is certain. When parents no longer discipline their kids, and when husbands no longer lead their wives, the patients take over the asylum, and that's what creates a scary family. Don't you become paralyzed by guilt and vacate leadership in your family. As Christians, we regain the moral high ground when we see ourselves in Christ. And don't pursue a peace at any price. Family life gets spooky when everybody is afraid to rock the boat and nobody is willing to hold each other accountable. And don't cower from a confrontation. Spouses need to stand up for what's right. Parents need to stand up to their kids. Tough love is a necessary family skill. This morning, if your family has been slipping away from you, I want to pray for you. And I want to ask God to help you get it back. I hope this morning you'll let him wash away your guilt. and You'll rise up in Christ, in the new creation he's made you. I hope that you'll replace your fears with faith. That you'll trust God to work on your behalf in your family. And that you'll let him lift you out of your weakness by trusting in his strength. Rather than scary families, let's all be faithful families. Let's make that our desire. Father, I I do want to pray for everybody that's here today, all of these couples, all of these families that are represented. Lord, there are all kinds of forces and all kinds of factors that are fighting against families today. We recognize that. We know that. But Lord, we know that you're for the family. And Lord, you are for parents. It's your for marriage. Lord, we know that you want to bring all of your resources to bear in our homes and in our hearts to help us be the kind of parents and the kind of husbands and wives that, that our families deserve. Lord, I pray that today we could trust you more than we ever have before. Lord, that we could lean on you, that we could trust in you that you would give us courage today to stand in the gap, to not vacate, to not be afraid, to not be paralyzed by our own guilt, but to rise up in the forgiveness that you so freely offer and be the parents that you want us to be, to not be afraid of a confrontation, to not worry about what other people might think when we need to do what's right. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to realize we've got one crack at this with our families that we'll never get today back, that it's 24 hours that's gone forever, that we can never get it back. Lord, I pray that we could start today standing in the gap for our families. Father, we love you for your goodness toward us. We love you for who you are and the example you set for us. And Lord, I pray that you would bring to bear this afternoon great comfort and great encouragement to our hearts. We thank you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, this afternoon, we've got one more session, and we're going to talk about uh, something that I think is very, very important. And and it's a little broader than it sounds, but we're going to talk about playing favorites. We're going to talk about how so often families succumb to playing favorites. And not just favoring maybe one child over the other, but how often... Uh, wives favor kids over their husband. Sometimes husbands find it easier to just get off with the kids and to spend time with mom. There's a lot of favoritism that goes on in families, and we're going to talk about that destructive pattern and how we can change it and how we can straighten that out in our last session this afternoon. Okay, yeah. Yeah, we, we've got some time for some questions, some nice questions, some easy questions. <laughs> it's very polite questions. <laughs> We've got time for some questions like that. Anybody have a question that you want to throw this way? Well, I've explained it all, Vince. I've told them all there is to know about families. That's pretty good. <laughs> now, we'll, we'll say, listen, does anybody have a question? Oh, she doesn't have a nice one. <laughs> well, all right. Let's, uh, let's hear it. Let's try it. Uh, can a dad with a debased mind change? Can God give him the mind of Christ? Oh, you're li- absolutely. Yeah, can, her question was, can a man with a debased mind 
you know, with a dirty mind change? Can, can God give that man the mind of Christ? Yeah, you're looking at evidence right here. <laughs> Absolutely he can. And, and I thank God that he can. If not, we need to close up shop and go on down and get drunk at the vineyard or something. <laughs> but the good news is, is that God can transform dirty, rotten minds, prejudiced, bigoted, hate-filled minds, dirty minds, lustful minds. God can transform those minds through the power of Jesus Christ. He can cleanse us. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you've cleansed us. And he can wash us pure as snow. Though your sins were as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they were red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You know, if, if I didn't believe that, I'd, I'd close up shop and find something else to do. Yes, absolutely. Jesus can change a life. He can transform a life. As a matter of fact, he specializes in it. It's his specialty. And so if you've got a dirty mind, you come to the right place. <laughs> Jesus specializes in that, in washing you clean and making you whole. And, uh, but it all starts by seeing yourself in Christ. It starts by receiving what he's done for you and letting it clothe your mind and, and change your identity. You, that's the first step. You got to see yourself as a new person in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. My old man was crucified with Christ. I'm a new Sandy today. I'm the new Sandy Adams. I'm the newer, improved, vet, better version. Yeah, I get wi wider, wider, wi wider is wider, and the grime is out, and all the rest of it. The new tide is standing right here today. <laughs> I've been cleansed. So you, that's where it starts, by seeing yourself in Christ. That's where it starts. And then you think on things that are pure and think on things that are holy, and you begin to wash your mind. And, and it, it starts. It's a process, but it starts by embracing this new identity that God has for us. I've got a slide. It's, it's a cool little slide, but it's, a, it's the mirror. And there's this little kitty cat looking at the mirror. But the reflection in the mirror is this big lion. And I love that picture. That little kitty cat's learning to see itself as a big lion. And that's, that's our job as Christians, you know. We have the lion of the tribe of Judah living inside of us. We need to see ourselves in, in light of what Christ has done for us. You have a question? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, what, at what point do you uh, trust your kid, you know, 19-year-old boy, uh, and just uh, go out? And, you, know, you have to trust that he's going to make good choices and he's telling you where you're going and who you're going to be with. And on the other hand, you know that he's telling a lie. How? Well, you trust him, but you cut the cards. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? I mean, it, it's a combination. I mean, yes, you, you, uh, you, you trust someone. Um, you know, I trust all the good people here in the, in the room today. I trust you guys. You guys are all Christians. You love the Lord. You're great people. Uh, but when I put my computer bag down back there, I ask uh, Scott, right? He asked Scott in the sound booth. I said, Scott, would you keep an eye on this computer bag back here for me? I trust you. But I still want him to keep an eye on that computer bag back in the, <laughs> in the room there, you know. That's kind of parenting. That's kind of parenting. I, I want to trust my kids, but also know their kids. And, and I, I've got to be smart about it. And when, my, and when my kids earn my trust, then I trust them more. When they don't earn my trust, I trust them less. And, and, I, um, and, I, and I've got to give them some freedom. I've got to give them some rope. But I don't want to give them so much rope that they can hang themselves. And so it, it's a balancing act. There's this tension here that we have as our kids get older. 
You know, I just uh, talked to the Kellys. They, their son graduated from high school. Congratulations again. Uh, but, I, but I warned them. I said, it's just beginning. Yeah, I used to think when I got my kids through high school, my parenting was essentially done. Oh, was I wrong? I mean, I mean, when the kids hit those, those uh, really funky years of, of uh, college and in between college and sometimes college and then not college and all those kinds of things that are going on and they're thinking about getting married and they're trying to get jobs and life decisions are being made, stakes get real high. And, you know, you're wise. Your son is 19. You're, you're wise to let him make some mistakes now. I think one of the smartest things that we did, we had our kids in Christian school early on in the younger grades. But when they got to high school, uh, we, we put them into public school. And um, one of the reasons was they were all uh, sports oriented, and so there were more sports opportunities in, in high school, in the public high school. But another reason was that we wanted them, we didn't want their first exposure to the outside world to be in college when we weren't around. We wanted to be there when they interfaced with the, the world out there so that if they did stumble, if they did have some problems, or if they did, uh, you know, fall, that, that it would be a soft landing, that mom and dad would be around to help them work through what had just happened and understand and, and realize their mistakes. We'd be around to help them process what had just happened. We wanted to make sure that that occurred before they went off to college. And I think that was smart of us. One, one of the probably few smart things we did, but it was, I think, a smart thing that we did. And, and I think it sounds like to me you, you've got that same uh, mentality. I think that's wise. Um, I think it's really important to remember that it's, it's uh, as Yogi Berra once said, it ain't over till it's over. Sometimes we get so frustrated with our kids and they, they make bad decisions and and we get so bummed out and we think, what's going to happen to this kid? And, and you know what? We forget what we went through. We forget the stumbles we took, the mistakes we made. And yet God was faithful to us and he got us through all that. And we're sitting here today and we're praising the Lord. And, it, you know, it just ain't over till it's over. Our kids are going to make some mistakes, but we're going to love them. We're going to show them God's grace. We're going to help get them through it. Uh, but we're going to be tough with them along the way. And we're going to remind them that respect is earned. You want respect? I hear that, son. You want respect? Well, you need to start acting respectfully. And, and you need to, uh, respect is earned. Trust is earned. Uh, and when you lose trust, it's hard to get it back. It's possible, but it's hard. I have this thing I do uh, whenever I, I counsel someone who's a marriage where there's been some infidelity in the marriage. Uh, what I'll do is I'll take a glass of water and I'll bring it into the counseling room and I'll say, I, I want you to notice the water in this glass. This is like the trust in your relationship. And then I take that glass and I, I water and I throw it out on the carpet. And I turn and hand it to the person who's, who's been guilty of the infidelity. And I'll say, now I want you to take and I want you to get that water back in that cup. It's a pretty powerful illustration. Because immediately, oh my, it's possible, but it's going to take a lot of hard work. And it's going to take some outside help. It's possible, but it's going, it's going to be work and it's going to take some help. And the same is true with trust in a relationship. Once you lose trust, it's awful hard to get it back. Uh, that's what I try to teach my kids. The most important thing in life is trust. Your trust in other people and their ability to trust you. If we can't trust you, we can't have relationship. We can't have any meaningful relationship if I can't trust you. And so trust is something that's sacred and that's important. And once you lose it, it's, it's hard to get it back. But, but there needs to be, you know, that, that's what you're teaching them. You're teaching them now how to get it back and how to, how to rework that trust. Um, I have a son who's, who's had some of those issues in his life. Uh, I bought him a new pickup truck. It wasn't a brand new pickup truck. It was like a 2005. It was a nice pickup truck. It was a 2005 old Chevrolet. And I bought him this pickup truck, and he was so cool in that pickup truck. He thought he was some, something else in that pickup truck. And he was on his cell phone and went right through a red light and smashed right into a lady and totaled out the 
pickup truck, and uh, that's been about three years ago. And uh, today, he drives a 98 Mercury Marquis. <laughs> it's ghetto, Dad. <laughs> I know it's ghetto, son. But that's your, your driving is ghetto. <laughs> it's got a... It's got a block in it to keep the, you know, I got a block stuck in it to keep the bumper on, on you know, it's, that's, that's what it's like. And uh, he's got a little girlfriend now, and whenever she comes around, um, they always come in her car and ask her, I said, Megan, have you ever been in Mac's car? No, Mr. Adams, I, I, I try to help him out every time I get together with him. I, I, we always drive my car. She's never even been in his car. Dad, I'm embarrassed in this car. Well, maybe you'll learn how to drive better. And, and what really makes it even, even worse is I bought a truck at the same time, and the money I got from his truck I used to pay off my truck. <laughs> and he knows that. <laughs> and I said, son, when you, when you learn how to handle your responsibilities, you see that nice truck I'm driving over there? You, you'll build own one of those. But I tell him, I said, I can't afford your insurance now. I can't afford you to put you back in a truck now because I can't afford your insurance now with that uh, accident on your your record. And so uh, it's been three years now. Now, I'm probably going to buy him another truck soon uh, because he's responded very well. He's grown up a lot the last three years, and he's he's made some good decisions, and uh, he's earned back a lot of trust that that he lost. And, um, And so things are looking better for him now. I'm not telling him that, but Things are looking really good for him in the near future. Uh, but it's something he's had to earn back. He didn't just get it back. You know, I got that big chunk back from the insurance company. I didn't, didn't run right back out and buy him a nice truck. You know, he, he needs to drive that marquee for a while. Yes. So it's about three different colors, too. That's, that's the other <laughs> cool thing about it. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So It's horrible. I mean, it, it's just a horrible situation. That's why I'm saying this 20, the 20 something years, the early 20, late teens, early 20s, you, you've got all the responsibility and none of the, not much authority anymore. <laughs> Absolutely. But you still control the purse strings to, to a large degree. And, and I would encourage you to, to leverage that. Yeah, that, that's sometimes that's what you have to do. I mean, you control the purse strings and, and you're not going to uh, support, uh, you're not going to support certain lifestyles and you're not going to support certain uh, decisions. Um, my, again, my college age son, I mean, he, uh, uh, he has his baseball scholarship, which pays a portion of, of his college, but I pay the rest of it. And he's, uh, uh, last year, it was a rough year. I mean, year before last was a rough year. And I, I told him at the end of the year, I said, look, I said, I'm not paying for you to go down there and, and, you know, live in the kind of environment you've been living in. That's not the deal here. I, I could choose where I spend my money, and I'm not, I'm not paying for that. I says, you need to come back with a new game plan showing me a whole new setup of how you're going to live, the friends you're going to hang out with, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to make some changes. And uh, the good news is, is that, is that he believed me, and he knew that if he wanted to, to go back to college, he was going to have to make some changes, and he did. But, but would he have done that? Would he have gone through all that effort had there not been some leverage applied? I don't think he would have. Perhaps he wouldn't have. I hope he would have, but <laughs> I think my leverage in the situation helped him make a good decision. And this year, he's had a great year. It's been a great year. Uh, but but you you got to find the buttons. You, you got to find the right buttons to push. And every kid has different buttons to push. But you got to be willing to got to have the courage to push those buttons. And you and you've got to uh, you got to find what language your child speaks, and then speak to them in that language, if you know what I mean. Yes. 
And we're going to talk about step parents or uh, step kids in the next session. Uh, yes, blended families. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of actually I think that's an excellent observation. Did everybody hear that? She, she, you know, she recalled the situation where David got angry, but he did nothing. And she, she's making the comment that uh, a lot of people think that getting angry is doing something. That when they get angry, that they are applying a consequence to their, to their child. And she, her comment is, is that's not the same thing. I mean, you can get angry to your blue in the face, and, and your kid uh, may just skate right through. I mean, that's, just getting angry at your child is not applying a consequence and not disciplining your, your child. Getting angry is the easy thing for you to do, but applying discipline takes a lot more work. It, it's a whole other issue. And so that's a great observation. I agree with that wholeheartedly. It's easy to get angry. It's harder to, to apply proper discipline. Yes. But wait a minute, you live with a pastor, don't you? <laughs> so, I mean, like, you've got the know-it-all answer, man, right there in your own home. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yes. Save the big stuff for dad. You deal with the, the, the daily things, the, the, um, the little um, times when they step out, in li out of line and, and they need to be corrected and they need to be brought back in line. You deal with all those things. But when the mutiny happens <laughs> and the big issue happens, you say, your dad's coming home. And he's going to deal with this when he gets home. You know, that shows uh, your respect for your husband. That shows that dad is, is uh, in charge. A lot of times you, you don't, you, you have a hard time distinguishing when your mom and you're there all the time. It'd be the same thing if dad was there all the time. But when you're there all the time, you have a hard time distinguishing. And the kids have a hard time distinguishing what what is a heavy, heavy issue, a real important issue, and just kind of a minor infraction type, type thing. You know what I'm saying? And um, in order to help them distinguish that, save the big stuff for dad. And you handle the, the daily things. And, and when, the, when, they're, when your kids have really stepped out of bounds and there's a mutiny on, on your hands, you say, Dad's going to take care of this. And all of a sudden, in their minds, boy, that's, this is the big deal now. We got Dad coming home. That's how my wife handled it. And, um, um, you yeah, know, that's how my wife handled it. And it seemed to work pretty good. You know, until we got into, uh, until the kids got into the, the uh, teenage years and, and into the, even the, uh, the older, you know, the worst problems my wife and I've had with, to, had between us, and I, I and I could, if she was sitting here, I'd, I'd say this. But the biggest conflicts my wife and I have had personally have been over how to discipline our grown kids, and I say grown kids, our our teenagers. Um, my wife's dad died when she was eleven, and so she didn't grow up with a father you know, in the, in the house, at least through the teenage years. And, uh, 
And, and having said that, I also say I probably didn't handle everything real well all the time. Um, but there, there are moments with teenage boys when, I mean, it, it kind of gets physical. Even if it doesn't get physical, it looks like it's almost going to get physical. Does that make sense? Any of you guys with teenage, you need to help me out if you've got teenage boys. I mean, it, it just by nature of it, you know, you're, you're kind of in his face, and he's kind of bristling up, and you're, you're saying, you don't want to go there, son. And, and you know, you're kind of having those moments there with your son. Um, my wife never understood, she didn't understand that, and she'd try to get in between, and she'd try to smooth things out, and, and uh, that created a lot of problems between her and I. Uh, and she had to back, back down, she had to leave and just go to the other room. That's what she had to do. She couldn't stand there and watch it. She had to leave and go to another room. She had to let me work it out with them. And, and I did. Um, but there were certain things they weren't going to do. And if it came down to something, um, I mean, I was prepared. But, I mean, we worked through it. But it, but you, it gets that way sometimes with, with older kids. The, the, the important thing is you can't back down. I mean, you can't let the patients take over the asylum. You've got to restrain your kids. And you do it in love. And you do it calmly. And very seldom do you, do you ever get anywhere by losing your temper. Please, please misunder, don't misunderstand me. The parent is, one, is the one who has to be in control. Uh, I'll, I'll just say, there was a, there was a, I'll never forget the day in, uh, uh, when I was 19 years old. And my dad and I had a conflict. And I'll never forget it. It was in the back hallway of, of our house, and I was mad, and I didn't think he knew what he was doing, and uh, we were arguing, and, and all of a sudden, my fists came up like this, and as soon as they did, my dad looked at me and said, son, you hit me once, it'll be the last time you ever hit anybody, and I'll never forget it, and I knew he meant every word of it, and I knew if I had let, thrown a punch at my dad, I was going through that back wall. And I know he would have done it. And I would have deserved it. Uh, and I, and I, I, I thought, well, Sandy, what are you doing? So, I mean, I, that kind of stuff happens in family. That's, family life is scary. It gets scary sometimes. And it's not for the faint of heart. But you've got to restrain your kids. And you've got to love your kids. And you've you got to work with your kids. And my kids, I hope today, my kids know that I love them. All four of my kids would tell you that they, there's, not a, uh, there's not a doubt in their minds that their dad loves them. And, uh, you know, I, it, people ask me, now that your kids are grown, I mean, would you have done anything different? Of course I would have done something different. I mean, obviously I would have done something different. But I will say this. I can say this as God is my witness. Every day when I left, laid my head down on the pillow, I left it all on the field. I did the best that I knew how to do that day. And, you know, it may not have been good enough, and I may want to go back and change it now, but, but I know in my heart of hearts, I tried to be the de best dad I could be every single day of their lives in, while they were in my house under my roof. And... Um, I tried, and I think at the end of the day, your kids will appreciate you trying. Yeah. Oh, if it well, if it's an older daughter, I just kind of melt and <laughs> and and let her have her way and vacate leadership. <laughs> You know, I, I, I uh, no, I'm just teasing. It's lunchtime. Yeah, that's a great place to stop right there. <laughs> let me just say, let me just say with, old, let me say with older daughter, daughters need to be disciplined just like sons need to be disciplined. And, and um, you just, I would approach my daughter differently than my son, so, personally. We can talk at lunch, too. It'd be great.
Okay. Lord, thanks a lot for lunch today. We thank you for all your bountiful blessings toward us, especially those that you've poured out on our families. Lord, we pray that uh, you'd bless our fellowship, bless our food, and uh, give us a good session this afternoon. And thank you for these uh, couples who love you and love their kids and love their families. Bless them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.